Today I'm going to go over the parts for a small build, which is a dedicated capture computer. I would like a system that I can just have under the desk next to my main system where I can do firewire video capture for my VCR, which even though it's not particularly computationally intensive, when you're doing other stuff on the computer, just due to Windows scheduling, it can end up dropping frames. So it's usually better to just have a dedicated system rather than having to sit there and wait two hours for a VHS to record. So I'd like to just have a dedicated system for that. I'd also like to be able to do HDMI and DVI capture from devices that I'm tearing down, which I'll be using this card for. and screen capture so i have a gtx 1050 ti here from gigabyte four gig low profile but i'll be putting on the standard bracket for this build i won't need much processing power so i'm just using the cpu from my test bench which never actually got a published video even though i recorded one it ended up being that i recorded a video for it talking about my test bench it's just a simple test bench i ended up not publishing it because i changed a whole bunch of stuff on it after filming and I just never got around to reshooting those parts. This is just an Intel Core i3-8300, very low end, but not the lowest of end. You can go down to the Celerons and stuff, but this will be more than enough processing power for what I'm going to be using it for. It shouldn't have to do any real video encoding using the CPU. I have the solid state drive out of my home theater PC, which doesn't get any use anymore due to the rearrangement of our apartment. We kind of move stuff around, so I don't really use the home theater PC anymore. So I've got a fresh Windows install on this that's activated, and I'll, you know, I'll fumble through getting it to reactivate with new hardware. The low profile cooler from Noctua that was originally in my PF Sense router. PF Sense router, took it apart. I switched the motherboard in the NAS to a dual 12 core system. So I have 24 cores, 48 threads of processing power that I can virtualize uh, PF Sense no problem and you know save running another machine 24 seven. So I've got this spare and I've got the power supply out of that unit, which is a Seasonic Focus Gold, uh, fully modular, it's 550 watt, more than enough for this, even if I end up upgrading the CPU in the future. I've also got PCI Express Firewire card. This works perfectly under Windows 10. Uh, this is the only a uh, 400 megabit version. My capture card only uses 400 meg megabit. There's an 800 megabit version of Firewire, kind of generic capture card. It also does analog. There's a little breakout cable for it that lets you hook up RCA connectors and stuff to it. This thing can cover a lot of hardware, so if I'm doing a teardown of something. I, this is usually what I capture the video on. And I've also got a spare two terabyte drive, which is, well, just spare, and I need somewhere for bulk storage. Picking a motherboard was quite difficult because I have this mini ITX board from ASRock, which is actually quite nice and dual gigabit ethernet. I have the uh, 8300T still installed in this from the PF Sense router. I gotta take that out because I'm probably gonna be selling this because I determined that this isn't gonna work for my purposes. One of the things I want to do with this new build is I do kind of really want to have 10 gigabit ethernet. Now that I got an eight port 10 gigabit switch, it's kind of hard to go back to one gigabit when you're moving video files around. Unfortunately, mini ATX boards only have one slot. I have a micro ATX board. It has more slots. The problem with that one was I'd have to buy a card for it and that's a hundred bucks. And if I'm buying a card, I might as well get a new board if it means I can change out some stuff because I don't have a mini ITX case so I'd have to buy a case anyway. If buying a case I might as well buy a case that can hold an ATX board and it is just small. I figured for a little bit more I got a very nice super micro gaming board which is a Z390 chipset. Totally overkill for an i3. I am well aware of that. I like to buy a little higher, especially with motherboards, in case it gets repurposed. As you can see, I'm repurposing stuff today from two different, three different builds, because I have my home theater PC, my PFSense router, and my test bench, because I often repurpose all these parts. I like to kind of overbuy, because this could be my wife's computer in the future, or something like that, you don't know. I can put in a much faster processor in the future and I'd want a Z390 so I can overclock it. So the benefits of this board, other than having all the modern interconnects and stuff for capturing if I need to, it also has a very nice VRM, 10 gigabit ethernet, lots of slots, which is great. 
lots of 1x slots, which is even better because I have all these stupid 1x cards that I have to install. And it's funny because even on my X299 board, if I put in a card, it may actually start affecting my GPU just because there aren't any of these little chipset 1x PCI slots that I can use. I'm just using these big 16x slots off the uh, CPU. So it's kind of nice having all these little guys on it. This also lets me use M.2. So I get the Optane drive and I'll have nice, you know, little add in things like having a USB-C port if I need to get some additional stuff charging on USB-C ports. Even though this will be next to my main computer, it's always nice to have more USB ports available, especially for charging things. You know, it doesn't matter what computer they're plugged into. This is the C9Z390 CGW from Supermicro. For some reason, they have branded their gaming motherboards Super O, which is absolutely terrible. Who the hell thought that was a good name? Look at all the gaming product lines from other companies. They're like Republic of Gamers, Dominator, and all these other like intense set. Super O. Really? Super O, that's what they came up with. Uh, either way, despite the name, it actually has a pretty good feature set. Box has the usual stuff, serial ATA antennas, IO shield, that kind of crap manual. I have to say the amount of features you get on this board for around $250 at time of filming. I think it was initially $299, but currently I bought this one for $250. And keep in mind, you're paying $100 because you would have to buy a $100 card for 10 gigabit. The way I'm looking at this is $150. And even then, it's kind of lower than that because I'm going to sell the old board. Going to get like almost $100 for the board. I don't have to buy the network card. So yeah. W weird math, but I'm going to stick with it. I need a double check of the arithmetic. Looks good, Flight. All right. Good here? He's good, Andy. Okay, we'll go on those numbers. You have the usual assortment of USB ports, audio, all that stuff. Like I said, lots of slots, lots of serial ATA ports, which we won't really be using except for a couple. And of course, the peel. Play harder? Oh god. It just keeps getting worse with their branding. Come on, Super Micro. You make great server boards, but really? Play harder? Super O? Oh god, that's sad. Bear with me, I couldn't be bothered to move everything off my desk and rearrange everything to get this case in shot. The case I went with, Fractal Design Mesh of IC, one of the smallest ATX motherboard compatible cases you can get. It looks kind of big in the picture, <laughs> but it's actually very small, especially compared to the Define R6, which is my personal favorite. I wanted a small case that was pretty cheap. I think this was like 79 bucks and has really good airflow so you can run the fans at a low speed. Tempered glass and you got your cool angular front, which I actually really like. I do like the design of it. So that should work well. I've got a bunch of Noctua fans kicking around here, so I'm just gonna throw a bunch of fans in there. I finished my build. There weren't any unexpected things when building in the case. It was a pretty straightforward experience if you've ever used a fractal design ace. I really like it. It's a really small ATX case. The only thing I'd like to see is a USB-C port on it. They're I'm sure they'll revise this soon because they seem to be doing that with most of their cases. And maybe if they could just tweak the internal design a little bit to make this area a little wider. As it is, you can't really use 140 millimeter wide radiators in here. Even if they just pulled this out about five millimeters that way, it would really make a, a difference for how much space you have for rads. So I think that'd be a nice little change. You don't want to take away that much space for cable routing. You don't need that much in a small case. Other than that, the build was really straightforward. There were no problems with the motherboard other than the ridiculous RGB lighting on it. By default, it is so absolutely absurd. I don't know what anyone at Supermicro was thinking. With most of the LEDs on red, you can really see how for an aesthetic choice, it's kind of silly to have these RGB LEDs on this thing. I mean, I know you got to because it's a gaming board and you have to have it, 
but the diagnostic LEDs never shut off for some reason, even when it's reading double zero for a normal boot. Normally you would want these to just power off once they've successfully booted. My X299 board from ASRock does that. And there's two green LEDs that never change on the board. So no matter what you've set the colors to, you always have these two stupid green LEDs on it. But I mean, anything is better than the stock configuration. That was just ridiculous. Cable management on the back was really easy. There's tons of routing area on this side for the cables. But like I said, even if you cut out a little bit, that'd be great and it'd give you more room for rads. The placement of the SSDs is great. I ended up swapping the SSD I had earlier for an Intel one. I do like the huge cutout on the back of this motherboard tray. It's much bigger than the one on my Define series, I think, because I can actually get to all the screws on this if you take this little SSD tray out, which is really nice because on my current board, to take the mono block off, I have to take the whole motherboard out, which is really annoying, to the point where I might dremel out some of the metal from my Define just to keep me from having to do that again. And yeah, you can at idle, it's pulling only 38 watts. So this should work really well just for capturing video. And uh, I really like the motherboard. It has some quirks with the BIOS. It, it does a lot of weird reboots when it's starting up sometimes, like when you're tweaking the settings. I, I don't know if it was just acting weird or not. I updated it to the newest version, but it looks like the newest version is just a couple bug fixes and I don't think it really changed anything. The BIOS is pretty primitive compared to like a modern ASRock one. Supermicro really basically just put like a server one and just added a couple gaming things to it. You have a vent on the top of the power supply shroud so that you can mount your power supply upside down if you'd like, like I do, because this will be on a carpeted floor. I don't want it trying to pull in air through a carpet. So I mount the power supply upside down so that it can pull in from the case. And other than that, I think that's pretty much it for this build. Pretty straightforward, simple build. I mean, low power, low uh, everything. 